Liquor in in excess is taboo at all times, except after six (laughs) o'clock. That is meant to be funny. (laughs) Now, I don't exactly mean what they said here, uh, uh, except if you you leave out that word excess, yes, I would say it was taboo at all times. But uh, liquor in reasonable amounts, I can take a cocktail, I can take two cocktails, but that would be about my limit at one time. Oh, I could take three, but if I did, I'd come as to say some of the things maybe that I shouldn't say and do some of the things I ought not to do and it wouldn't do me any good. I like to be in control of my mind all the time. What's the sense of uh, pickling your stomach and your brain so that uh, you're not yourself? <laughs> People find out too much about you. You don't want them to know. And in addition to that, you look silly, don't you? Don't you, don't you think that a person that, whose tongue has been loosened up with liquor, don't you think he makes a... A spectacle of himself that doesn't do him very much credit, no matter who he is. If I go into a home, as I often do, where they take a cocktail, I don't say, oh, no, 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 thank you. I, I don't touch the stuff. <laughs> oh, no, I don't say that. I take the cocktail, and if I'm not in the mood to drink, if nobody's looking, I set it down somewhere. I carried around I carried around a cocktail one the whole evening before I got a chance to sit down. As soon as I got a chance, I dumped it into the sink, and they thought I drank it. But I didn't, because I was to make a speech that night. Believe you me, I'd have been a silly thing to got all pepped up with liquor before making a speech. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, with uh, liquor or smoking, with everything else, if it's in, if it's moderate, and if you take it instead of it's taking you, I'd say it wouldn't be too bad. But uh, the better plan is to get over using it at all. <laughs> And uh, then on relaxation, you need play to ensure sound health. Therefore, balance all work with an equivalent amount of play. Now, that doesn't mean an equivalent number of hours, because it doesn't work out just that way. <laughs> Believe you, I, I, can work, uh, I can work one hour, and in five minutes of playing, I can offset that. When I'm writing, I'm an inspirational writer, as you may have guessed. I write when I'm keyed up. I'm up on another plane entirely. And it's intensely hard on the physical constitution. And 40 minutes is all I can stand of it. And then I go into my piano and sit down and play for five or ten minutes. And then I've uh, completely balanced off that uh, intense uh, activity that I've been engaged in. And then uh, sleep eight hours out of every 24 if you find time to do it. Might have a fine habit to get into, to get uh, some good sleep. And when I say sleep, I mean get in there and lie down and don't turn and twist and groan and snore and all that sort of thing. Lie down and sleep peacefully. And uh, get in such good uh, uh, report with, your, uh, <coughs> with yourself, your own conscience, and your neighbors that uh, you don't have anything to worry about. When you hit that old pillow, you can go right smack to sleep. Do you know how to get anybody to do whatever it is you want him to do? That's right. Do something for him first. Now, that is as good a definition as I could have used if I have thought of it for a year. Do something for him first. Now, that is right. And look how easy it is to do something nice for another person. You don't even have to ask him, do you? No, you don't. Now, how do you grade on that? How many times uh, when, you want, uh, when you want to have a great long list of people who are standing ready as an army to help you when you need help, how many, how, what are you doing to cultivate that army in advance of the time of need? You can't just go out and go the extra mile uh, this minute and the next minute you uh, turn right around and ask the person to whom you rendered that service to render you twice as much service. You can't work it that way. It won't work that way. You've got to build up a, there's something called goodwill in advance. And then when they, it's got, the, the timing has got to be right. Now, there are a lot of people who will go the extra mile only for the sake of expediency. They do it just to put you under obligations, and they don't time it sufficiently. that will now allow you to forget about it, so to speak. Turn right around after having done you a favor and ask you for two or three favors. Haven't you had that experience? Haven't you seen other people make that mistake? Of course, you haven't made it, but well, the other fellow. Or have you? I don't believe there is a principle of this philosophy that would, uh, if I had to select one principle with which you can do the most, with the most people, I'd say it's this principle of going the extra mile. Because that's the one thing that anybody can control that wants to do it, 
You don't have to ask anybody for the privilege of, of, of going out of your way to be nice and to be of help to people. You don't have to ask anybody for the privilege. And the very moment you start doing it, you profit by the law of con contrast. Because most people are not doing that. Well, uh, let's see. Now, number, what is the next one? That's right, 33. Desire for revenge, for real or imaginary grievances. Which is the worst, to have a desire revenge for a real grievance, an injury somebody's done for you, or an imaginary grievance? Well, I wonder now. Think that went over. Why, uh, why shouldn't you have, what happens to you when you have a, an expression of revenge, or desire for revenge, for any reason whatsoever? What happens to you? Does it hurt the fellow? Oh, that's it. That's the point. It hurts yourself. How does it hurt yourself? It makes you negative. That's the idea exactly. It poisons your mind. It even poisons your blood if you maintain it long enough. Any kind of a, of a mental attitude will get into your blood and, and they interfere with your sound health. Number 34, the habit of producing alibis instead of satisfactory results. To what extent do you uh, immediately begin to look for an alibi when you make a mistake or when you do something that doesn't turn out right or when you neglect to do the thing that you should have done? What, to what extent do you come across and say, well, it's my fault, I'm, I lay it on the line, face the music, or do you begin to conjure up a, a set of alibis to justify what you've done or neglected to do? Now, that's the point on which you're grading yourself. What is the preponderance of your habits on that subject? And I'll say that if you are an average person, then the chances are that uh, in the majority of cases, you look for an alibi to justify what you do or what you refrain from doing or neglect doing, if you're an average person. If you're not an average person, I don't, I'm sure you'll not be if you become properly indoctrinated to this philosophy, you will not look for alibis because you know that's only weakening, that's a crutch that you're leaning on. You'll face the music, you'll acknowledge your mistakes, You'll acknowledge your weaknesses, you'll acknowledge your errors, because self-confession is a marvelous thing. It does something to the soul. When you really know what your faults are and confess them honestly, you don't have to spread them to the whole world, but confess them where a confession is, is necessary. I had a student of mine come into my office about a few days ago and make a confession that's going to be a more use to her than anything that's happened since uh, she was a very small girl. Now this student was suffering because she had not yet learned how to distinguish the difference between her needs for things and her rights to have them. Had you ever thought about that? She needed things very badly and she was willing to get them the wrong way. But. There are a lot of people who make that mistake. You cannot tell the difference between the things they need and the things that they have a right to get. Number 35, lack of dependability. Uh, that uh, perhaps will be a little bit hard for you to grade yourselves on. But generally speaking, you know whether you're dependable or not. You know whether your word's dependable. You know whether uh, your performance in your occupation or your job is dependable. You know whether uh, your relationship to your family, your wife, or your husband, or your children, you know whether you're de a, a dependable family man or woman, you know that. You know whether you're dependable or not in connection with your credit relations with people where you buy things on credit. You know that. Is it a wonderful thing to have dependability among uh, your friends? You know, just know exactly where they are, where they're always going to be regardless of what happens. Is it a wonderful thing to have dependability among your loved ones? Well, you know they're not going to let you down on any score, at any time, for any reason. How many, how many of you have a half a dozen people like that in your life? Absolutely dependable under all circumstances. My, my, oh, what a lucky group of people this is. I'd say that if you have three people like that in an entire lifetime, you're indeed fortunate. People that are dependable under all circumstances. I'm not so sure, but what I can count the ones that I have that are like that on the fingers of my two hands, as many people as I know all over the world. Dependability, what a marvelous thing it is. Now, number 36, unwillingness to assume responsibilities commensurate with one's desire for compensation. In other words, your desire for the good things of life 
good income and all that, nice home, nice car, nice wardrobe of clothes, but unwilling to assume the responsibilities to entitle you to those things. Now, how do you agree on that? In other words, are you willing to assume the necessary responsibilities to entitle you to all the things in life that you want to get out of life? That's the point that you're grading yourself on. And number seven, the failure to obey the conscience when it seems advantageous not to do so. Are there, little, are there times when you uh, tell your conscience just to step aside for a few moments while you don't look right now because there's a little bit of transaction of business here you want to attend to that's a little bit off color? Do you ever do that? <laughs> oh, I'm not going to ask you to vote on it. I wouldn't do that. Well, you know, I, I think you could do that a few times to get away with it, but I think if you got in the habit of it, you're, you, you would convert your conscience into a conspirator that would endorse all of the mean things you might ever want to do. And that would be bad. That conscience was given to you by an all-wise creator so that you would always know what is right and what is wrong without having to ask anybody. And if you're on to good terms with your own conscience, if you really respond to that conscience under every circumstance and let it be your God, then you are a very fortunate person and uh, you have uh, been using that conscience properly. But if there are times when uh, you waver, you undecided and you make, make your conscience step aside, then uh, you need to grade yourself low and to begin to work on yourself on that score. I think it's a, a marvelous thing that the Creator should have given each individual a judge advocate, so to speak, to sit over all of his acts, all of his deeds, and all of his thoughts, and tell him when he's right and when he's wrong. Number 38, the habit of unnecessary worrying over things one cannot control. Now, how are you going to agree on that? Unnecessary worrying over things you can't control. If you can't control the thing that you're worrying over, what can you do about it? Make the most of it. Why, you can adjust yourself to that thing that you can't control in a positive mental attitude so as to not let it get you down. Or you can transmute that uh, worry over into something uh, on another subject where you can control it. And then uh, number 39, uh, neglect to recognize the difference between failure and temporary defeat. Have you ever thought about that? When is failure a failure, anyhow? <laughs> That's right. When you accept it as such, no matter what the conditions are, if you accept it as failure, that's it. Is failure ever a failure until you accept it as such? No. no, of course not. It's temporary defeat, perhaps, but certainly not failure. You know, if, uh, if you took no for an answer, if you were selling, and you took no for an answer every time you heard it, you'd never make a living selling. Because it's easier for people to say no than it is to say yes, and they don't mean it at all. They just mean that they haven't yet been broken down by a good salesman. <laughs> Temporary defeat and failure. Who determines whether a circumstance in your life is a temporary defeat or failure? Who determines that? That's right. You're the one who determines that. And 40, lack of flexibility in adjusting to the varying, cir varying circumstances of life. Lack of the flexibility of your mind. Do you know it's uh, necessary at times for you to go along with uh, unsavory bedfellows, people that you don't like. You go along with them until such time as they drop out of your life. Of course, you could have it out with them right where you stand. But uh, if you do that, you probably would uh, oftentimes get the worst out of it. You can wear them out, walk them to death, by going along with them for a time. If you make an incident out of everything that you dislike in people, if you make an incident out of it, well, you'll always be in difficulty. If you let these things that uh, are food for incidents pass by, time is a wonderful cure, a wonderful agent. You know it's the greatest doctor on the face of the earth of everything. Time. Oh, mother time. Or is it father time? Well, anyhow. Maybe it's both. <laughs> there are a lot of things in this world that can be cured only with time. Now, there are people who fret themselves to death and wear themselves out making incidents out of uh, very silly, small, unimportant things every day of their lives. And there's not a day ever goes by in the life of any of you that you couldn't make an incident out of something and have an unpleasant uh, scene with somebody if you would allow yourself to do it. But, of course, being a student of this philosophy, you're going to grade yourself about, let's say, about 80% on that one, flexibility. That is, the ability to adjust yourself to these circumstances that you don't like without going down under them and without making an incident out of them. And you may have a very peculiar cause of failure that I haven't mentioned here at all. 
It'd be uh, most interesting to see what it is if you do have one, because I have given you a pretty good catalog here of the things that cause people to fail. And uh, one of the interesting things about this uh, list of 40 things that cause people to fail, what, what is the most interesting li- thing about that list? We have control. They represent things that you can do something about. Now, isn't that true? What would be the use of my having you make this analysis if you couldn't do anything about it? You can eliminate every one of those causes of every one of them. And you can almost do it instantaneously. There are a few of them, and it'll take a little time for you to develop up uh, more positive habits, but for the most part, every one of these causes of failure you can wipe out of your character this very night by determining to do so, by determining to develop a more agreeable set of circumstances. No matter what your adversity may have been, go back, after you've had this lesson, go back for the last ten years and take every unpleasant circumstance that you've ever had and begin to search now and see where that seed of an equivalent benefit was, even though you didn't find it and didn't use it. It's very difficult to find the seed of of an equivalent benefit in an unpleasant circumstance while the wound is still open and hurting. There again, timing is important, but if you'll give it a little time, make up your mind that you're not going to go down under the circumstances, you give it a little time, and then go back and evaluate it carefully, and you will find that you will have learned something from it of benefit. There are two kinds of cooperation, one based upon force or coercion, and the other is a voluntary, based upon voluntary action, found based on motive. The vast uh, majority of all circumstances of cooperation, I think, are based upon some form of force or coercion. Employees oftentimes cooperate with their employer, but uh, there's a certain amount of coercion in it, a certain amount of fear that if they don't cooperate, they'll not have their jobs. There are other circumstances where the uh, employees cooperate with the employer because the employer has made it so beneficial for them to work at that place, that they do it willingly. Any kind of cooperation that's forced, or forced on people, or based upon any type of cooperation, um, of coercion, is not desirable. Because people only cooperate on that basis as long as they have to, and when they get to the point where they don't have to do it any longer, they kick over the traces. Relatively speaking, there is a small percentage of Uh, employers throughout the United States who understand the advantage of having their employees cooperate with them on a willing basis of friendliness based upon benefits that they extend to those employees. Cooperation differs from the mastermind principle in that it's based upon coordination of effort without necessarily involving the principle of definiteness of purpose or the principle of harmony. The men working in the military service, an army of men for instance, Working under their superior officers represents a a tremendous amount of power based upon cooperation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's harmony or that they like what they're doing. There's a certain amount of coercion and force there. They're doing what they uh, have to do. Sometimes they like to do it, but sometimes they don't like to do it. Cooperation based on the mastermind principle is the medium by which great personal power may be attained, and no one has ever acquired such power without the aid of these principles, a fact which places them in the category of indispensables. Now, cooperation is indispensable in four major relationships, and here they are. In the home, in one's job or profession, in social relationships, and in support of our form of government and free enterprise. Certainly those are musts. And if every citizen cooperated in those uh, four respects, this would be a better country than we still have, uh, than we have yet. Now here are examples of cooperation not based on the mastermind principle. Soldiers working under army regulations, employees working under rules of employment, government officials working under laws of the nation, professional men such as lawyers, doctors, dentists working under rules of ethics of their profession, citizens of a nation related under a dictator. Observe the manner in which a cooperative effort assumes greater powers when the principle of cooperation is combined with the mastermind principle, involving harmony based on a definite motive. Now here are some examples of that. 
of government officials when working in harmony with and supported by a majority of the people, as in the case of uh, Roosevelt's first term in office, when the emergency of an economic depression supplied motives for harmony, and the motive was a desire for economic recovery affecting all the people. I have never seen a finer illustration of power attained through a combination of the principles of cooperation and the mastermind, and I witnessed there in the Roosevelt administration during his first term in office. We had a motive. We all had a motive in getting back at the president. That motive was, self, was survival. We were in danger. There was an emergency, and we had to close ranks and get behind him, whether we agreed with his uh, political principles or not, and we did that. Did it on a grand scale for a time, but the, as soon as the emergency passed, or was softened by that uh, combination of the mastermind principle and cooperation began to disintegrate. And before Roosevelt uh, finally got out of office, there was an upheaval and uh, uh, lack of harmony and a lot of other things that uh, caused a lot of people <clears throat> worry and annoyance and not to mention loss. Employers and their employees with a motive such as that which inspired harmony in the Arthur Nash Clothing Company of Cincinnati when the company faced bankruptcy. While I was publishing the Golden Rule magazine, I got a hurry-up call from Mr. Nash of the Nash Clothing Company in Cincinnati to come over to Cincinnati and see him. And when I got over there, I found he was in trouble. He was, in, he was really bankrupt. For no reason that he could explain, a business that had been going for years profitably, all of a sudden became unprofitable, and the business dropped off to where they didn't have enough to really pay the payroll. When I went over the situation with Mr. Nash, I said there is only one thing that can save your business, and that is if you work out a plan whereby the employees will take a new lease on life, put their heart and soul into the business, go along with you, you can, you can save the business. And we worked out a plan whereby they would... Uh, receive at the end of the year, in addition to their regular salaries, a bonus consisting of a percentage of the profits. Quite a bit of details that I'll not go into, but that was the sum and the substance of it. Mr. Nash called all of his employees together. He got up and told them what he had in mind. He said, I think I should tell you, first of all, the company is bankrupt. We don't have enough money to pay this coming week's uh, payroll. And he said, uh, for a long time, this business has been going downhill, and I noticed that all of the employees were losing interest. Uh, that enthusiasm that used to prevail here is no longer here. The spirit of the thing has gone. Unless we can recapture that spirit, that willingness of enthusiasm for everyone to jump in and do something, why, uh, we're all in the same boat, namely bankrupt. And he said, I have a plan, and uh, I think it'll work. It's based upon the golden rule. I have a plan whereby... Uh, if you'll all come down Monday morning and start in on a new basis, the basis uh, in the same mental attitude that you were in ten years ago when we were thriving, go to work, I'll pay your wages as soon as we can make the wages, including the back wages that I'll not be able to pay you this coming week, and uh, if we make a go of it, at the end of the year we'll divide the profits on a basis that will give you the same standing as a stockholder in the company. I'm going to leave the room, and then you talk it over frankly, and decide what you want to do, and then when you want to see me, you let send for me. He and I went to lunch. We were gone about an hour, and uh, a messenger came over and called him away from the lunch and went back, and they announced that uh, what had happened. They all got together, and they decided that not only was going to accept this proposition, but uh, they came down the next day with their savings. Some of them had money in old socks, some of them in tin cans, some of them in savings accounts. They laid $16,000 in cash on his desk. They said, there it is, Mr. Nash. If that's the way you feel about us, this is the way we feel about you. We earned this money down here. It isn't much, but if it'll do any good, use it. And when you can pay it back, why, pay it back. And if, it, if you can't pay it back, why, that's all right, too. You see, they had caught the spirit, don't you know, of real cooperation. The company began to thrive, and before Mr. Nash died, some ten years later, it became the most prosperous uh, mail-order clothing business in the whole United States, and as far as I know, it still is that today, despite the fact that he's gone. Same business, at the same location, making the same kind of clothes, with the same people doing the work, 
failing one day and starting to succeed on a grand scale the next day. And what, what, is that, what, what happened there? There was a change of what? Change of mental attitude. What caused them to change the mental attitude? Was it fear that they'd lose their jobs? No, it wasn't that, was it? They had a motive. Mr. Nash had inspired them with his sincerity and purpose in making them that kind of an offer. They were touched by it. They knew it was sincere. And they made up their minds they were going to be just as uh, good a sportsman as he was. They were not going to let him outdo them. And when you get any group of people together on that basis, I don't care what their problems are, they'll meet those problems successfully. They always do. And then uh, the Rotary Clubs and their members throughout the world. There's a marvelous illustration of uh, the mastermind principle and the harmony in the ranks. I remember when that Rotary Club was organized. I belonged to the first club ever organized here in Chicago. I was a member of the original group that Paul Harris organized. And in those days, we... Uh, uh, the purpose of the club was to honor Paul Harris and to help build up his legal practice without violating his ethics. <laughs> that was the original purpose of it. But we finally grew bigger than that purpose, and the purpose became the idea of uh, developing fellowship among the members. A good feeling. Well, the Rotary spread all over the world and has become uh, really an outstanding influence for good wherever it is touched. You don't do anything in this world without a motive. There must be a motive to inspire everything that you do or everything you refrain from doing. The only person that does, does things without a motive is an insane person. He doesn't have to have a motive. Well, at first, the opportunity to get increased compensation and promotion is one of the most outstanding motives for gaining friendly cooperation. And wherever that has been put into use in any business that I know anything about, there has always been a very beneficial and a very profitable return. Recognition for personal initiative, pleasing personality, and outstanding work. Now, that's a, a strong motive to inspire cooperation. Giving person recognition. When he does a good job, he will say so. Do something about it. I know an employer who has the uh, birthdays of all of the wives of his employees, his male employees, and all of the children. And every, every birthday, they all get presents from him with a card signed by him in person. Well, uh, his organization represents just one great big family. In other words, they have a, he, he has built himself up in the hearts of the people in the home where the man works. And you can just imagine what that does to the man himself. And then the third, taking a personal interest in one's private problems. You know, that's a powerful motive, too, for gaining friendly cooperation. Taking an interest in the problems of people that you're associated with or that you're working with. Helping them to solve problems. You know, a lot of people say, oh, well, uh, after all, this, uh, my problems are mine, but the other folks' problems are his, but I don't, I'm not interested in them. And you have, you have the right to do that if you want to. But it won't be profitable to you. It won't be beneficial. If you want to have a lot of friends, if you want to have a lot of cooperation, you will make it your business to look around and wherever you can be of help to people, you will start in being of help to them. And next, a system of friendly competition between departments and uh, in departments between individuals. It's a system of friendly cooperation. Now, in a sales organization, for instance, if you can have a, a different group competing with other diff uh, groups in the same organization on a friendly basis, They'll all strive to do their very best to, in order to win because of good sportsmanship. And uh, able sales managers very often set up that kind of a motive to inspire their salespeople to do better jobs. Then the hope of future benefits in the form of some yet unattained goal which can best uh, be attained by mutual cooperation. In other words, something that you want to accomplish with a group of people where it can only be accomplished by your all pulling together in the same direction at the same time in the spirit of harmony. Well, now, you could mention other motives. Uh, maybe in your particular case, uh, you need the cooperation of somebody. Maybe you would know what uh, kind of a motive that you could plant in the mind of that person to get that cooperation. But certainly you can't get it by force or coercion and hope to benefit by it. Because if you get it by that method, sooner or later the cooperation will play out. And it'll turn into resentment. Andrew Carnegie's method of inspiring cooperation was based on four principles. First, 
He established a monetary motive through promotions and bonuses. That was one of his most uh, potent and influential motive in getting men to cooperate. In other words, uh, all the men who worked for Andrew Carnegie knew that they had the potential possibility of becoming an exceedingly well-paid executive. They'd seen man after man do that very thing, starting to get the ranks and climb right on up to the top. And second, his question system. He never reprimanded any employee offensively, but allowed the employee who deserved it to remand himself or herself through carefully directed questions. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? If he wanted to reprimand a person or discipline him, he'd call him in and start asking him questions, which could only be answered in one way, the way Mr. Carnegie wanted them answered. Well, I think that is very smart. And if he wanted a fault brought out, he'd let the man bring it out himself because he'd put questions to him that would force him to bring out the fault or tell a lie. And then, of course, the man didn't want to do that, especially when he knew that Mr. Carnegie knew what the lie was. <laughs> that was one of the things that indicated what a smart man Mr. Carnegie was. He knew how to get the best results out of people without unnecessarily hurting them or offending them. And uh, next, he always had one or more men in training for his job. And several of them made it. Isn't that a wonderful thing for an employer to have a number of men standing around training for his job? You don't think they'd be disloyal, do you? You don't think they'd lie down on the job? You don't think they'd uh, refuse or neglect to go the extra mile, do you? Well, why no? Well, they'd be very silly if they did. Mr. S Mr. Carnegie knew how to hang out to plums, so to speak, for people to reach for. And uh, while he kept the plum just a little bit ahead of the reach of the man, he caused him to grow stronger and to build a longer arm for reaching by having that plum out there for him to reach for. That was much better than throwing the fear into a man's heart, losing his job or something of that sort, as so many employers had done. And he never made decisions for his employees, but encouraged them to make their own decisions and to be responsible for the results thereof. Isn't that a wonderful thing? <coughs> he would not make decisions for his executives. And for his uh, under-executives. And for those who are in training for executive jobs. I was in the office of Mr. Curtis, Cyrus H. Curtis, of owner of the Saturday Evening Post, who was also one of the collaborators in the building of this philosophy, when his son-in-law, Edward Bach, came in and apologized to me for interrupting our meeting, and he said, there's something that I must speak to Mr. Curtis about that has to have an answer immediately, and he had a telegram in his hand. And uh, he hurriedly explained to his father-in-law that a problem in connection with buying the supply of paper that they were going to need for the whole next year involving a, a tremendous amount of money. Paper for the ladies' home journal, and maybe the Saturday Evening Post, and maybe the country gentleman, all. He told his father-in-law what the problem was, and, uh, and he uh, also told him that there were three things they could do about it. And he mentioned them. And he said, now what I want you to tell me is which one shall I do? Would you be interested in knowing what Mr. Curtis said to him? He went, uh, went ahead and very briefly analyzed each of those three problems, each of those three things, analyzed them for their good points and their bad ones. And then when he was through, now he said, it's your responsibility, that's my analysis, it's your responsibility to determine which one of the plans you're going to adopt. And the box said, well, thank you, and walked out. And when he left, Mr. Curtis said, if he makes the wrong decision, it'll cost us nigh on to a million dollars. I said, well, why didn't you give him the right decision? He said, if I had, I'd have ruined a good executive. That's why I didn't. Mr. Bach did become a good executive. He made the, the Ladies Home Journal the outstanding magazine of its time. But he didn't do it by having his father-in-law make decisions. He made them himself. Well, and that's what made Mr. Carnegie such a successful man. He taught people to make decisions, but also to be responsible for the decisions when they made them. That's an important little item, too. Our American system of free enterprise gets friendly cooperation when it is not interfered with by outside influences, by the profit motive. 
In the United States, if we took away the profit motive, it would uh, take the very, uh, the very warp and the woof of our whole system of free enterprise away. And there are certain pressure groups that are trying to do that very thing all the time, to take away the profit motive. You have to have a motive for everything you do. And we, have, we believe in the United States, in our system of free enterprise, the finest uh, combination of, pro of uh, motives that uh, exist anywhere in the world. I don't uh, know what you think about this philosophy as far as you've gone, but I just want to tell you this in closing. That if you get 50% of the benefits that are available to you out of this philosophy, if you get, if you get 50% of the benefits, not 100, but just 50% of the benefits, you can so thoroughly change your lives that uh, the next, uh, the coming year that's ahead of you can be the most outstanding year of your life. And from here on out, the rest of your life, you can uh, enjoy a controlled destiny, one that you'll hew out for yourself, where you'll find happiness, pleasure, contentment, security, and where you will enjoy the friendship and the goodwill of people around you because you will create circumstances leading to that end. Uh, the imagination, said someone, is the workshop where in this fashion the purpose of the brain and the ideals of the soul. I don't know of a better definition than that. That there are two forms of imagination. Uh, the first one is synthetic imagination, which consists of a combination of recognized old ideas, concepts, plans, or facts arranged in a new combination. Uh, basically, new things are few and far between. As a matter of fact, when you speak of somebody having created a new idea or anything new, the chances are a thousand to one that uh, it's not anything actually new, it's a reassembling of, of something that's old and something that's gone before. Uh, number two, the creative imagination, operating through the sixth sense in the subconscious mind, has its base in the subconscious section of the brain and serves as the medium by which basically new facts or ideas are revealed. Now, any idea, plan or purpose, that is brought into the conscious mind and repeated and supported by emotional feeling is automatically picked up by the subconscious section of the brain and carried out to its logical conclusion by whatever natural means that are practical and convenient. Any idea, plan, or purpose that is brought into the conscious mind and repeatedly and supported by emotional feeling. Now, there is something I want to call your attention to. Ideas in your mind that are not emotionalized or over which you're not enthusiastic or in connection with which you don't have faith seldom produce any action. You've got to get emotion into your, into your thoughts. Or you've got to get enthusiasm or you have to have faith before you get action. Now here are some examples of synthetic imagination applied. First of all, Edison's invention of the incandescent electric lamp. You may be interested in knowing that uh, there is nothing new about Edison's electric lamp. Both of the uh, factors which, when combined, made up the incandescent electric lamp were old and well known to the world long before Edison's time. It remained for Thomas A. Edison to go through 10,000 different failures and to find the way of marrying these two old ideas, bringing them together in a new combination. As you may know, some of you, or all of you, one of these ideas consisted in the fact that you could take and apply electrical energy to a wire and at the point of friction the wire would become hot and it would make a light. A lot of people found that out before Edison's time. Edison's problem was in finding some means of controlling that wire so that when it was heated to a white heat where it would make a light it wouldn't burn up. <clears throat> he tried all of these experiments, to be exact over 10,000 of them, and uh, none of them worked. And then one day, as was his custom, he laid down for one of those cat naps to turn the problem over to his subconscious mind. And uh, while he was asleep, the subconscious mind came up with the answer. I've always marveled at uh, and wondered why it was that he had to go through 10,000 failures before he could get his subconscious mind to, uh, to act and give him the answer. So uh, he woke up after one of those cat naps, and as he came out of his sleep, he saw the other half of his idea. He had half of it already. He saw the solution to the other half of his problem. It consisted in the uh, charcoal principle. You know, uh, to produce charcoal, you put a pile of wood on the ground and set it to fire, and then cover it over with dirt 
allowing just enough oxygen to percolate through to keep that wood smoldering, but not enough to permit it to blaze. And it burns away a certain part of that wood, leaving the rest which is called charcoal. You know, of course, that where there is no oxygen, there can be no combustion. Taking that concept with which Edison had long been familiar, he went back into the laboratory, he took this wire that he had been heating with electricity, put it in a bottle, pumped the air out and sealed the bottle, cutting off all oxygen, no oxygen could come in contact with oil, turned on the electrical power and it burned for eight and a half hours. And that's the principle to this very moment on, under which the this electric lamp operates. That's why when you drop one of those bulbs, it pops like a gun. The air has all been drawn out of it. The reason being, they cannot permit any oxygen to be inside of that bulb because if it, if it were there, it would quickly burn the filament up. Two old simple ideas brought together through synthetic imagination. And if you'll examine the uh, operations of your imagination or the imagination of successful people, I think you'll find that uh, in a large proportion of the cases, the, uh, what has been used has been synthetic imagination and not creative imagination. These ideas, you know, of uh, giving arrangement to old ideas and old concepts can be very profitable. Uh, you may be, uh, of course, you may have discovered that there isn't, there's only one new principle in this philosophy that you studied, just one new one that you may not have been familiar with before, and I have only made one contribution to it. Everything else is as old as mankind. But what did I do? I used my synthetic imagination and I reassembled. I, I sorted out the salient things that go into the making of success and organized them in a way that they had never been organized before in the history of the world. Organize them in a simple form where you or anyone else can take a hold of them and put them into practical use. Now, I often wonder why somebody else smarter than I didn't think of that a long time ago before I started into it. You know, when we get a hold of a good idea, we always are inclined to go back and say, well, why in the world didn't I think of that? Or if you get it, you think, why didn't I get it a long time ago when I needed the money? Henry Ford's combination of the horse-drawn buggy and the steam-propelled thrashing machine is nothing in the world but the uh, use of synthetic imagination. He was inspired to create the, the uh, automobile when he first saw his first thrashing machine outfit being uh, pulled along by a steam-propelled uh, engine. They had this thrashing outfit with the machinery attached to the locomotion of the steam engine going down the highway, and uh, Mr. Ford uh, observed it, and then and there he got the idea of taking that same principle and putting it onto a buggy instead of the horse, and making the horseless buggy, which eventually turned out to be known as the automobile. Now examples of creative imagination. First of all, all basically new ideas originate through single or mastermind application of creative vision generally through the mastermind application of creative vision. Now, you'll observe that when two or, people, two or more people get together and begin to think along the same line in the spirit of harmony, and they begin to work up enthusiasm, and all the people in the group begin to get ideas. And out of that group will come an idea pertaining to the thing that they're discussing in the main. If they, have a, if they go into that discussion for the solution of a major problem, somebody will find the answer, depending on whose uh, subconscious tunes in to the infinite storehouse and picks the answer out first. And oftentimes, the answer will not come from the, uh, uh, the, mo uh, the smartest or the most brilliant or the most e best educated man in the group. Oftentimes, it'll come from the least educated and the least brilliant person in the group. Here are some uh, examples of uh, creative imagination. Take radium, for instance that was uh, discovered by Madame Curie. Now, that all Madame Curie knew was that, uh, in, theoretically, there should be some radium somewhere in the universe. She hoped it would be on this little ball of mud that we call the Earth. She had a definite purpose. She had a definite idea. She worked it out mathematically and, and <coughs> determined that there was radium somewhere available. Nobody had ever seen any. Nobody had ever produced any. Nobody had ever refined any. Imagine uh, Madame Curie starting out to find radium in comparison with the proverbial story about the person looking for a needle in a haystack. Believe you me, I'll take the haystack and the needle every time in comparison with her task. Do you have any idea what it was that gave her first cues, how she went about uh, searching for it? You, you don't think for a moment she went out with a spade and a, and a mattock digging for it, in the ground looking for it, do you? 
No, 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 she didn't do that. She wasn't that foolish. She conditioned her mind to tune in on infinite intelligence, and infinite intelligence directed her to the source. The exact process that you use in attracting riches or in attracting anything else you want. You first condition your mind with a definite picture of the thing you want. You build it up and support it with the faith in your belief that you're going to get the thing you want. And you keep on get wanting it, even when the going is hard. Well, you take the radar and the radio, for example. Both of them products of creative imagination. And the Wright Brothers flying machine. Now, nobody had ever created and successfully flown a heavier-than-air machine until the Wright Brothers produced theirs. Now, Wright Brothers had no encouragement from the public, and when they announced uh, that they were going to fly the machine, they had flown it successfully and were going to demonstrate it again down at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, when they announced that to the press, the newspaper men were so skeptical they wouldn't even go down there. Not one single solitary newspaper man went down there on the biggest scoop in the last hundred years. There they were. Smart Alex, you know, wise guys, they knew the answers. How many people do you see like that all the way through when somebody comes up with a new idea? Smart Alex, wise guys, people who don't believe that it can be done because it's never been done before. There is no limitation to the uh, application of creative vision. The person who can condition his mind to tune in on infinite intelligence can come up with the answer to anything that has an answer. Anything, no matter what it is. And Marconi's invention of wireless communication. And Edison's talking machine. You know, Edison never uh, created but one, as far as I know, but one idea that came out of creative vision, and that was a talking machine. Uh, before his time, nobody had ever re recorded or reproduced sound of any kind. Nobody had ever done that, nor anything even resembling it. And there had been no talk about it, no stories written about it, as far as I know. And Edison conceived that idea, and uh, almost instantaneously, he took a piece of paper or an envelope out of his pocket and with a pencil drew a crude sketch of what became later the first Edison uh, um, recording machine, talking machine, they called him then. The one that had a cylinder on it, you know. And when they tried it out, when they tried to model out, the, the thing worked the very first time, quite in contrast. You see, the law of compensation paid him off for those 10,000 failures when he stood by while he was working out the incandescent electric lamp. Don't you see what a generous and a fair and just thing the law of compensation is? Where you seem to be cheated in one place, you will find it will be made up in some other place in proportion to your deserts, whatever they may be. That works with penalizing, too. When you escape uh, the cop at one corner, because you run a red light, maybe you escape him again, but the next time he'll catch you <coughs> on two or three counts. <laughs> you'll find he finally catches up with you. Well, here out here in nature somewhere, there's a tremendous cop and a tremendous, tremendous recording machine, recording all of our good qualities and all of our bad ones, all of our mistakes and all of our successes. And sooner or later, they all catch up with us. Now, <clears throat> a creative vision in evaluating the great American way of life. We still enjoy the privilege of freedom and the richest and the freest country ever known to mankind, but we need to use vision if we are to continue to enjoy these great blessings. Now, if you look backward and see what traits of character have made our country great, here they are. First of all, the leaders who have been responsible for what we have have in the American way of life made definite application of the 17 principles of the science of success with emphasis on the following six. Now, they didn't at that time, they didn't call uh, these principles by these names. They probably weren't conscious that they were applying these principles. And one of the strangest things about all of the successful people that I work with, not one single solitary one of them could sit down and categorically give me step by step the modus operandi by which he had succeeded. They had stumbled upon, stumbled upon, mind you, by sheer accident. These uh, principles uh, are listed here. First of all, definiteness of purpose. Second, going the extra mile, rendering more service than they're paid for. I want you to go back and measure the, seven to the, the 56 men that signed the Declaration of Independence. I want you to go back and measure what they did by these six principles and see how definitely you can trace the application of them to their act. Definiteness of purpose, going the extra mile, the mastermind principle, creative vision, applied faith, and personal initiative.
The makers of American Way of Life did not expect something for nothing. They did not regulate their working hours by the time clock. They assumed full responsibilities of leadership, even when the going was hard. Looking backward over the past 50 years of creative vision, we find, for instance, Thomas A. Edison, through his creative vision and personal initiative, ushered in the great electrical age and gave us a source of power the world had not previously known. Think of that. That one man ushered in a new age, the great electrical age, without which all of this industrial improvement that we've had, all the radar, all the television, all of the radio, would not be possible. What a marvelous thing that one person did to influence the trend of civilization all over the world. And what Mr. Uh, marvelous thing Mr. Ford did when he brought in the automobile, brought to backwoods and Main Street together, he shortened distances. He improved the values of lands by causing marvelous roads to be built through them. He gave employment directly and indirectly to millions of people who would not otherwise have had employment, and to millions of people who now today have businesses supplying uh, the automobile trade. Then Wilbur and Orville Wright, they changed the size of the earth, so to speak. Shortened distances all over the world, just those two men operating for the good of mankind. Then Andrew Carnegie, through his creative vision and personal initiative, ushered in the great steel age, which revolutionized our entire industrial system and made possible the birth of myriad industries which could not exist without steel. And not satisfied with the accumulation of a vast fortune of his own and the raising of scores of his associate workers into sizable fortunes they could not have accumulated without Carnegie's aid, he finished up his life by inspiring the organization of the world's first practical philosophy of personal achievement, which makes the know-how of success available to the humblest person. What a marvelous thing one man could do operating through one other man. So you see now, when you begin to analyze what's happened here, what a marvelous thing can, be happen, can take place when an individual gets together with another individual and forms a mastermind alliance and begins to do something useful. There's nothing impossible to two people working together in the spirit of harmony under the mastermind principle. Without that alliance, if I'd had a hundred lives to live, I could never have created this philosophy. But the inspiration, the faith, and the confidence, and the go-ahead spirit that I got by having uh, access to a great man like Mr. Carnegie enabled me to rise up to his level, something I never could have done without, his, uh, without this mastermind principle and without creative vision. Because there have been times, times when logically, if I had listened to what would seem logic and reason, I would have quit this uh, philosophy and have gone to work with, and got myself a job, as one of my former relatives said uh, she thought I should have done. Job as a nice bookkeeper somewhere. I'd have brought in seventy-five dollars a week and been very secure. <laughs> been wonderful, wonderful. Be at home every night. Well, most every night, and everything would have been lovely. <laughs> well, believe you me, I had to fight that argument for quite a while. I did fight it successfully. I saw bigger things in life. I began to use not only my synthetic imagination but my creative imagination, and particularly the latter. And it uh, enabled me to pull aside the curtain of discouragement and of despair and to look into the future and to see there what I now know is taking place all over the world as a result of my having passed this way. All of that through creative vision. What a marvelous thing it is to be able to tap that thing called creative vision and through it to tune in on the powers of the universe. I'm not uh, making a poetic speech. I'm citing signs. Because everything that I'm saying is practical and is being done, and it can be done by you. Here is a brief bird's eye view of what men and women with creative vision and personal initiative have given us. First of all, the automobile, which has practically changed our entire way of living. Uh, those of you who have uh, been born in the last uh, 25 or 30 or even 40 years, I can have no concept at all of what the vibrations of the, this nation were under the horse and buggy age in comparison with today. Why, well, in those days, you could walk down the road or you could ride down the road in safety. <laughs> Nowadays, you can't even cross the street where there's a policeman watching in safety unless you are a very alert of limb and eye. The whole method of transportation, the whole method of doing business has changed as a result of that one thing called the automobile.
And then the airplanes, which travel faster than sound, and have shrunk this world to where the peoples of all countries know one another better. What a marvelous thing it is. Perhaps the Creator intended it that way. That uh, instead of all these wars and things that we've been having in the past, that by bringing, uh, reducing the world in size, bringing the peoples of all nations together within a travel distance of 24 hours or so, that they would become better acquainted and finally become neighbors and then become uh, brothers under the skin as well as on the skin. If the brotherhood of man ever takes place, it'll be because of these various marvelous things that the imagination of man has uncovered and revealed that brings us together and makes it more convenient to first assemble and to understand each other all over the world. You can't uh, carry on a war with a person that you're doing business with each day, the neighbor that you're living by each day. That is, you can't do it and have any peace of mind. You try to manage to get along with the people that you have to come into contact with. And when you come to know people, you'll be surprised at how many good qualities that people you previously didn't like have. If you come to know them as they are. And then the radio and television, which uh, give us the news of the world almost as fast as it happens. And it provides the finest of entertainment without cost to the log cabins of the mountain country and the city mansions alike quite an advance over the days of Lincoln as he learned to write on the back of a wooden shovel in a one-room log cabin. Isn't it a marvelous thing to know that down in the mountains of Tennessee and Virginia where I was born, famous only at that time for mountain feuds, corn liquor, and rattlesnakes, now you can turn a little knob and you can tune in the finest operas, the finest music, finest uh, everything, know what the world is doing almost as fast as it's doing it. You know, if we'd had those conveniences when I was growing up, I doubt that if I would have had my first definite major purpose, that of becoming a second Jesse James, I probably would have wanted to become a radio operator or something of that sort. How it's changed those mountain people down there, down all throughout the country and throughout the world. Just the result of these uh, things that the mind of man has brought forth to introduce people to one another. You know, it's a wonderful thing to, to have a system whereby you can have this old physical frame in fine condition to, to do anything you want to do any time you want to do it. If I hadn't had a system for keeping myself healthy and full of energy, I couldn't have uh, done the amount of work that I've done in the years past. I couldn't do the amount of work I'm doing now. As a matter of fact, at my age, uh, uh, with the health that I have, the condition of my physical body, I can run rings around people half my age uh, who, who, don't, who don't have the system that I have. And I, I have to keep myself in that condition for several reasons for it. First, call, first place, I enjoy living better if I, my body is uh, responds. When I uh, make demands on for enthusiasm, I want the, the physical basis to be there for that enthusiasm. I don't want to get up a morning ailing. I don't want to look in the glass and see uh, my tongue all coated. I don't want my breath to smell bad. <laughs> That's not, that's not so good, is it? Well, there's ways and means of avoiding all of that. And I, I hope that you'll get some suggestions out of this lesson that will help you keep your physical body in fine condition. First of all, let us take mental attitude. That comes at the head of the list, as you notice. Because <clears throat> without a health consciousness, in other words, without thinking and acting and being in terms of health, the chances are that you're not going to be healthy. I, I never think of ailments. As a matter of fact, I, I can't afford ailments. I just can't afford them. They take up too much of my time. They disturb my mental attitude too much. And you say, what? You can't afford ailments? How are, how are you going to help having ailments? I have them. Well, you may have them now, but when you get through this lesson, you're not going to have them, not as often as you did before. There is a way of controlling ailments. Mental attitude. First of all, there must be no griping in family or occupational uh, relationships. It hurts the digestion. Now, you will notice that every one of these things in connection with the conditioning of a mental attitude is something that you can control if you want to do it. No griping in family or occupational relationships. You say, well, I, I have certain circumstances in my family that makes it necessary for me to gripe, complain. Yeah. All right, change the circumstances. So you won't have any circumstances for griping and complaining. Now, the reason I mention family relationships and occupational relationships is there's where you spend most of your life. And if you're going to allow those relationships to uh, be based upon uh, friction and 
misunderstandings and arguments, why you're not going to have good health and you're not going to be happy and you're not going to have peace of mind. There must be no hatred. No matter how much a person deserves to be hated, you can't afford to do the hating. You just can't afford it because it's uh, bad for your health. It produces stomach ulcers and worse things than that. It produces negative mental attitudes that repels people instead of attracting them to you, and you can't afford that. It attracts <coughs> reprisals in kind, and it hurts digestion. If you hate people, they'll hate you. They may not say so, but they will. <coughs> there must be no gossip or slander. That's a pretty hard one to comply with, because there's so much wonderful material to gossip about in the world, it seems a pity. <laughs> Very great pity to cut you off from all that pleasure, but let's transmute that uh, desire into something that's uh, more profitable to you. No uh, gossip or slander because they attract reprisals and they also hurt the digestion. And there must be no fear because it indicates friction in human relationships and also hurts the, the digestion. And also, if there's any fear in your makeup, it uh, indicates very definitely that there's something in your, in your life that needs to be changed or altered. I can truthfully say that there isn't anything on the face of this earth nor in the universe that I survey around me that I fear. Nothing at all. I used to fear about everything that the average person fears, but I had a system for overcoming those fears. If I had a fear now, do you know what I would do about it? I'd have it out with myself. I would eliminate the cause of that fear. No matter what it took or how long it took, I would eliminate the cause of fear. I will not tolerate fear in my makeup. I just won't tolerate it. Because you can't have good health, you can't be prosperous, you can't be happy, you can't have peace of mind if you're going to fear anything at all, even death. Most of all death. Personally, I'm looking forward to death with a great anticipation. It's going to be one of the most <coughs> unusual interlude of my whole life. As a matter of fact, it'll be the last thing I'll experience. <laughs> I, I, of course, I'm putting it off a long time. I've got a job to do. And, all that, but when the time comes, believe you me, I'm going to be ready. It's going to be the last thing I'll do and the most wonderful thing of all, because I'm not afraid of it. And there must be no envy, because it indicates lack of self-reliance and it also hurts uh, digestion. Now, here, here are just some of the things. There are six things that I give you in the way of do's that will enable you to, uh, to maintain a mental attitude that is conducive of a health consciousness. And believe you me, the mind, the way you use your mind, has more to do with your health than all other things combined. You can talk about germs getting into the blood all you want to, but believe me, nature has set up a marvelous system of doctoring inside of you. And germ or no germ, if, you, if that system is working properly, that resistance that's in your physical body will take care of all those germs. Nature has a way of keeping, through body resistance, keeping down the supply so those germs cannot multiply. And the very minute you become worried or uh, annoyed or fear and break down that body resistance, uh, these germs begin to multiply by the billions and trillions and quadrillions. The first thing you know, you really are sick. But then your eating habits. Now, prepare the mind to aid you in eating with peace of mind. And there must be no worries or arguments or unpleasantness at mealtime. Do you know that the uh, average family uh, selects mealtime for the hour of discipline of the husband and the children, or the wife and the children, as the case may be? That's the one time you can get them all together, <laughs> and when they're not inclined to run away while you're giving them a tongue lashing. They will stand, and, uh, or sit rather, and eat it out <laughs> while you're <laughs> saying your piece. But believe you me, if you could see what happens to the digestion, what happens to the bloodstream, to a person who eats while he's undergoing punishment, you would know that's the wrong time to do it. Because the thoughts that you have while you're eating go into the food you eat and become a part of the, of the, of the energy that goes into the bloodstream. And there must be no overeating. It overworks the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidneys, and the sewer system. Now, most people eat twice as much as they really could get along with. Twice as much, if you please. And look at the amount of money you'd save nowadays with grocery bills, what they are. Astounding how much, uh, how many pe people overeat. I mean people who are doing sedentary occupations. Of course, a man who's digging ditches, he has to have a certain amount of meat and potatoes or something equal or two 
uh, necessarily, but a man, a man or woman doing office work or in, in a store or in a, in a house, for instance, doesn't have to have the same amount of food, heavy, substantial food that you would have on the outside working, doing manual labor. And then uh, you must eat a balanced ration with fruits and vegetables and plenty of water or the equivalent of water and some sort of juices. I, I have a system out in California of making one meal a day, at least one meal a day, on nothing in the world but live food. That is to say, vegetables, berries, nuts, melons, and things of that sort, all alive. Nothing that's been canned or processed in any way, shape, form, or fashion. And I can tell you that I have all the difference in the world in my energy while I'm at home uh, following my uh, established diet, which I can't do here in Chicago. They'd think I was nuts if I went into a restaurant and ordered the kind of a meal I have in Chicago. As a matter of fact, I doubt if I could get that kind of a meal. And don't eat rapidly. It prevents proper mastication. Now, I violate this one, but don't you do it. I can get away with it because I have a good, strong, vital body, but don't you try it. <laughs> there are a lot of people, you know, who eat too rapidly, and uh, not only that, but uh, it shows that you've got too much on your mind. You're not relaxed, you're not enjoying yourself. A meal should be a, a form of worship, you know. You should have your thoughts on all of the beautiful things that you want to do, your major purpose, or the things that please you most while you're eating. Or if you're eating with someone else, if you're engaged in conversation, it should be a pleasant conversation, not a fault-finding fishing job. Pleasantness. man sitting across the table from a beautiful woman, I don't see why he shouldn't talk about her beautiful eyes and her hairdo and her lipstick and all the things that women like to have you talk about sometimes if you're the right man. <laughs> Even if you're t sitting across the table from your wife, I don't know any reason in the world why it wouldn't help you and her too. Don't eat candy bars, peanut or, peanuts or snacks between meals, or drink too many soft drinks. If you want to take a drink, get a hard one. It'll do you some good. <laughs> Something like water, for instance. <laughs> Tripped you up on that one, didn't it? You know, I know people, I know office girls, for instance, that uh, make a whole lunch off of candy bars and knickknacks that they get out of the newsstand and a bottle or two of Coca-Cola. Well, uh, a young person, the stomach can stand that for a while, but it's not being treated properly, and sooner or later, nature makes you pay up for that kind of mistreatment of your stomach. Be far better if an office worker would go out and get a head of lettuce and put salad dressing on it and eat that or some fruit or some grapes or some anything that you get at the fruit stand. Be far better than eating these candy bars.